The agenda this week asked, who speaks for Islam? We explored the gender gap in the tech sector, and we weighed the economic risk of lower oil prices. The agenda's week in review now begins with hashtag been raped, never reported. You, you have really created something here. I mean, you, <laughs> I you have created a phenomenon, this hashtag been raped, never reported. Uh, tell us the background behind that. Sure. Um, it was a Thursday around lunchtime, and I'm not a morning person. <laughs> and I signed onto my computer, and um, Sue Montgomery of the Gazette had Facebook messaged me saying that she was really angry and outraged by the lack of belief of these women who had made these allegations. And let's start a list, she said. Let's start a list and we'll all sign my name to it and you sign your name to it and we'll pass it around. And, and then I said, well, maybe we should do it on Facebook. And then I just did it on Twitter. And I walked away, uh, jumped in the shower, got into my car, went to the office, signed on at the office and went, Whoa! How many responses? At that point, I had no idea. I have no idea. Tons. I mean, it was tons and tons and tons. And uh, then I just typed three more, my own story. Uh, 19, um, I think the first one was 1969 about being in a basement rec room, 1970 about a hotel room, 1974 about a stranger on a plane. This is you. Yeah, it's me. Your personal story, yeah, and which you had not discussed publicly before? I've only, no, never, not publicly, never, not once. Uh, and only one of those instances had I ever shared with anybody with only one person. I mean, even my sister called me on Saturday and she said, what? You know, <laughs> anyway, so, um, so I typed those and then I went out for drinks with some of my colleagues because it was my second to last day. And I came home, walked the dog, signed onto the computer and it was trending in Canada. And then I watched it like till three o'clock in the morning just explode uh, in the United States and around the world. Uh, I'd like to ask Holly Johnson, what kind of impact uh, you believe this new hashtag phenomenon has had? Well, I think it's, as I say, opening up an opportunity for, for women to tell their stories. And not only that, to, to expand the discussion about why women don't just come forward. And I think it's a very naive assumption that if a woman is sexually assaulted or she's sexually harassed, the first thing she's going to do is pick up the phone or go and run to the authorities. Uh, women are shamed and blamed for sexual harassment and for sexual violence, and there are many, many, many good reasons why women don't come forward. Um, and generally, what tends to go through the criminal justice system are cases that match the real rape scenario. So those that, that involve a stranger, severe violence, or threats with a weapon, the woman um, complained immediately, she was hysterical. That's the real rape phenomenon or stereotype that police tend to respond very quickly to and very aggressively to. Others um, and, and of course others in the woman's social environment but um, if others in the woman's environment blame her or she blames herself or if others minimize it or have another negative reaction then it's not going to go very far and women have internalized this blame um, and responsibility for sexual violence themselves so I think it's important um, and valuable to open up this discussion that it is a very very prevalent phenomenon and I want to ask you about one of the other consequences of all of what's taken place online, and that is you don't have to say anything particularly controversial online sometimes to get a whole heap of you-know-what coming down on your head from yeah. the so-called trolls out there. Yeah. What have the trolls been doing with this? Because um, from what I've been able to tell, not much actually. Yeah, not not as much. I'm not getting as many, you know, rape threats, rape threats and death <laughs> threats as usual. Uh, and what do you infer from that? I, I think they're a little bit scared to touch this one. Um, I mean, that's not to say that I don't think that they're out there, and I, you know, I'm, I, they're still being very active on other hashtags. But um, I think maybe because the public response to this has been so overwhelming. Um, that it's not as appealing to troll this hashtag. They're actually showing some discretion for a change. <laughs> maybe, maybe. maybe. <laughs> the first, what we call attrition, so we can say the dropping off through the justice system, mm -hmm. and we had rape law reform in 1983 that was intended to improve the situation for women, to encourage them to come forward, to um, increase prosecutions and, and that sort of thing. 
Um, so what we see here is that the police, first of all, they un unfound a higher percentage of sexual assaults than any other crime. Unfound uh, meaning what? That, well, the, the Statistics Canada definition for the Uniform Crime Reporting Survey is the police made an initial investigation and determined that a crime did not occur. So that might be you come home uh, one day and your car is missing, you phone the police, uh, the police come and your uh, teenage son has borrowed the car and you didn't know it. So they have to note something so they put unfounded for that. Gotcha. So, but in sexual assaults, there is research that suggests that there's other things that intervene there and that police often make decisions to unfound cases based on the fact whether the woman was um, intoxicated at the time, she can't be believed, uh, and most troubling if she's reported a sexual assault in the past. So the, the research that we have shows that there's a wide variation across the country in the percentage of, of un, unfounded cases by police departments, which shows that they're um, investigating these cases differently, that they, um, these kind of biases against women may creep in different ways in different police departments. So then they record it as a crime if they found it. So less than half of those result in having charges laid. And you know, some of those are situations where the woman withdraws, doesn't want to go any further, where the, it was a stranger and they just you know, can't detect the guy. Um, after that, only half of those are prosecuted. So something happens there when the charges are laid, only half of those numbers end up in the court statistics. Now, as I say, you know, it's difficult to kind of go from one set of data to another, but that's a pretty big drop. And then only half of those are convicted of a sexual assault. They may have been convicted about something else. We don't know that. So it's imperfect, but there's the biggest um, attrition occurs when women decide not to report. Only less than 10% of women report these crimes. Well, and let me follow up on that with Antonia, if I can. And again, if, if this follow-up is too personal, you feel free to tell me to just... Oh, at this point, I have okay. nothing no, left I, to lose. Well, I, uh, but I want to offer yeah. you that option, of Thank course. Thank you. Uh, you know, given the drop-off here and given your own personal experience with it, uh, did you report any of the... No. Uh, you no, never did. No. And why did you not? Okay. Well, first of all, um, I think the fact that it was, you know, 1969, 1970, um, and it was a different time. It was the Mad Men era, right? Uh, I don't know if I would have had the same reaction today. So we have to use that as a context. But the other thing is, is that I blamed myself. Uh, completely, uh, certainly in the first two instances. You know, I was 17. I thought I knew it all. I was in first year university. I was invited to a party to be hosted by a guy I had a crush on that I had met in my English 101 class. Hmm. And I walked in and I was the only girl, right? You know, my mom asked me, are the parents going to be there? And of course, I knew everything. I was 17. I was doing protest marches. I went, yeah, sure. And of course, they weren't. So I didn't want to come home and upset her. And, um, and, the, and the, there was no such thing as rape crisis centers or anything of, of that nature at the time. And as for the second one in 1970, um, again, I blamed myself. I, a friend of a friend who lived in um, Tennessee had a friend visiting from Belgium and Montreal. And would I meet him for dinner? And I said, sure. And I met him in the Contiki bar at the Sheridan Hotel in Montreal. We had a drink. Oh, he forgot his wallet. We were going out for dinner. It'll only take a minute. Stupid me. I went into his hotel room. So again, I blamed myself. And um, everything I think of it always comes back to blaming myself. And m I think most women do that. I shouldn't have had that drink. I shouldn't have worn that skirt, I shouldn't have been there, I shouldn't have gotten into that car, whatever it is, it's always about what the victim did and not what the perpetrator did. And are those sentiments, those that, that approach, is that still prevalent, do you think, in your generation? Oh, for sure. Still? For sure, yeah. I think um, a, a lot of the women uh, that I know who have been sexually assaulted on some level blame themselves. Um, and, and I think also a lot of people don't come forward or report to the police because they know that it's a, a lengthy process. It's um, very shaming to the woman coming forward. You know, they ask you a lot of personal questions. And as um, Holly said, so few of them result in convictions that it, for a lot of people it just seems pointless.
You chose four people, uh, I suspect three of whom are very well known on the cover, and one not so much. Ada Lovelace, who was she? Ada Lovelace was Lord Byron's daughter, and so she developed a poetical streak, but her mother, as you might suspect, wasn't particularly fond of Lord Byron when Ada was growing up. Uh, he had too much of a romantic streak for uh, Lady Byron's taste. And so had her daughter, Ada, tutored mainly in mathematics, as if that were going to be an antidote to being too romantic or something. Not true. She becomes somebody who loves poetry and math, somebody who loves the arts and loves the sciences, just like Steve Jobs or all the great innovators. They have a foot in both camps. She calls it poetical science. So for example, she looks at the punch cards that are showing the mechanical looms in England in the 1830, how to weave patterns. And she says, you know, these punch cards with my friend Charles Babbage, who was making a numerical calculator, her friend was, said, with these punch cards, we can have the calculator do anything. It won't just be numbers. It can do music. It can do words. It can do art. It can do anything that can be noted in symbols. And so she was the first person to see a general purpose computer, what we call a computer. And she even wrote a step-by-step -step series of instructions to teach it how to do things, i.e., she's the first person to publish a computer programmer, and that's why we call her the first computer programmer. And yeah, I mean, she, there have been some people who've disputed that, obviously, over the course of years. Do you think those are people who simply weren't prepared to give a woman her due, or is there more to it than that? Well, I think that, you know, sometimes she gets uh, given an outsized reputation, but you know, when people criticize her and say, well, she wasn't quite in, as good in math as, you know, she claimed to be, I say, okay, she did a computer program to generate Bernoulli numbers. Yeah, it took me about four days working on what are Bernoulli numbers, how would you do the sequence, and I say, if you don't think she's so smart, tell me what the seventh, <laughs> eighth, and ninth Bernoulli numbers are and how you would generate them, and that usually shuts people up. How did her contemporaries view her? Well, you know, she was published in a scientific journal with her own initials on the paper, which is unusual for a woman. And she was a very aristocratic woman. She was a Countess of Lovelace. Uh, so she was pretty well respected. She had a very close friend, Mary Somerville, who was also a woman scientist and mathematician. And those are the two pioneers in the 1800s of women who say, yes, we can be published in math. And in some ways, it's a shame, because women have been written out of the history of math and computing. What do you think the consequences are for the tech sector, given how you've written the history about it, if it chooses to somehow turn its back on half the population? This is a revolution, the digital revolution. It's like the American Revolution. We have our heroes of the American Revolution or of the Industrial Revolution. This is rev But if you have a revolution in which you exclude half the people, it's not going to be a sustainable revolution. What's really weird is about in 1984, I think 38% of, of people getting computer science degrees in America were women. That's now been cut in half. We're going the wrong way. Only 17% of people getting computer science degrees in the U.S. are women. One problem is they don't have the right role models. I think they now are starting to get them, and I hope this book gives more role models. But also, and I'm sure the women who are going to be on your show will tell you, there's a, not a friendly, open atmosphere amongst some of the hackathon, gameathon type people in the tech world, but that's got to change, and especially now with people like Sheryl Sandberg, Megan Smith, the Chief Technology Officer of the United States, so many, uh, Marissa, Marissa Mayer, Mayer, so many great women and women engineers, I think it's changing. Although the title of your book, in part, uses a word which may explain some of it, there are a lot of geeks in this field. And Geeks don't necessarily, is it, I mean, can I say this out loud here? Geeks don't necessarily know how to relate to women very well when they're in their basement coding, you know, for 20 hours a day. That's why we need girl geeks. The girl <laughs> geeks will inherit the world. <laughs> the guys who are superstars in this field are guys who are happy to sit alone in their basements and write code for 20 hours every day. Now, do women want to do that? I don't there are know. definitely some women yeah. that there are, are some sitting women in their basement writing code. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
Tech Girls has a, a campaign called Portraits of Strength. We ran it since March of this year. And if you look at the women featured there, they're primarily not your usual suspects, as you mentioned. Um, they're very, very passionate about what they do. They're in gaming. There are digital activists who rewrite games um, to represent better what a, a protagonist should be so that you know women aren't always getting rescued in games. And and they can actually, you know, change that. And they're coders. And yes. Well, in which case, what was your reaction to this whole Gamergate business, where, you know, this woman who is trying to make these video games actually mm -hmm. look more realistic and saner than the guys who programmed them in the first place are? Right. And she's and she's had the whole a whole heap of misery come down on her head as a result of that. So the thing that I want to underscore that is, even though everyone knows about Anita Sarkeesian and what has happened with her with Gamergate. Um, She's not the only one. This is actually very, very common uh, to the point where most of the women in gaming know about this. So now we have a hashtag and we have a name to talk about it. But it's not just in gaming. I think it, it exists in different versions in many places that are male dominant. And there is a shift that's happening. And that shift is not something that is looked upon favorably by the people who thought um, they ruled what I would call the programmer well, culture. Look at what happened to Kathy Sierra. Mm -hmm. I mean, that predates Game Gate, uh, Gamergate. I don't know if you're Tell familiar us, what's with the story? Kathy. Yeah. She's uh, probably one of the most renowned usability, and um, uh, she she wrote a book called Creating Passionate Users, mm -hmm. and uh, came from a very technical background and uh, got targeted uh, because she had some prominence by an online troll named Weave mm -hmm. who uh, did something called doxing her. So he basically put her public information out so that people could find out where she lived. And she just withdrew for the internet immediately. And, and you know, it was a real loss to the community because she's a really significant, powerful voice for women in technology, but also for users in the space. And uh, she came back to Twitter for a little while, and then it happened again, and she's gone again. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's one of the leaders in our community, and she doesn't feel safe enough to be able to have an online presence. On this an is different, basis. though, clearly, from you know, just women don't make up a high enough percentage of executive management positions, Very and different. so on. This is all about this is, you know, harassment. This is fear. This is threatening. This is four chan. Well, yes. So yeah. I, I think we we can't pretend that the online rape and death threats do not have an effect on women wanting to be in technology. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you, we can't pretend that that doesn't matter. So what's that about? This is this is men just simply wanting to have this sector be all male. Yes, primarily that's, so what they're saying is it's changing and we don't like it. That's what it really boils down to. Because a lot of the things um, in Gamergate, which has now become a meme, that this is uh, about ethics in games journalism, it's not. It's, it's not about that because it didn't start with this. And that's why I think reports like the one um, Catalyst has put out are really, really important, but there are one aspect of what we need to address. What I really want to say is, are we actually ready now to talk about uh, the more active sorts of uh, factors that affect women's uh, desire to enter tech, to stay in it? A lot of people would tell you that tech has a pipeline problem, uh, that there aren't pipeline enough- Pipeline problem means? Meaning there aren't enough women entering tech. They're not going to take computer sciences, they're not coding. I don't think that's the problem. If you have a sector that's lucrative, that's mm -hmm. um, you know a, a good choice in terms of a career, there is no reason why anybody would want out of it okay. other than they're not welcome. Can I put this chart up now? Because this is, I think this is sort of uh, amplifies on mm -hmm. all of what we've been talking about here. This is um, the Pew Research Organization, which um, looked at levels of online harassment or harassment, however you are pronouncing it, for men and women. And here we go. Uh, the darker line, the darker bar is male and the lighter one is female. And how about called offensive names? More men are doing it than are apparently women. Purposefully embarrassed, men lead. Physically threatened, more men doing it. Harassed for a sustained period, again, more men. But look at these last two. Stalked. Stalked. More females are encountering this than males. And sexually harassed, more females encountering this than males. And as you look at those numbers, I don't know, Jennifer, what jumps out at you? Well, that there's two very different ways that uh, the genders are responding to exactly what the issues are. Um, I, I think that 
uh, the activities of harassment and stalking are um, a lot more passive and a lot more insidious in many ways because it's hard to deal with a, a nameless, faceless opponent. Um, and uh, that's something that can be really terrifying, especially when you talk about the doxing, which is the idea of releasing people's public information so that somebody can either email them or go to their home or take some kind of other action with that information. Uh, uh, making public their private information, I think exactly. is what you mean. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Publishing it on sites like 4chan or Reddit. You obviously started writing this book before Islamic State started doing its thing, which has obviously captured a long great before. deal of attention long before. But so, t t tell us uh, if it wasn't that that prompted you to write the book, what did? Actually, ISIS, ISIL is not even that relevant because most of their victims are not Christian, and I don't think they speak for the mass of Muslims. This goes back the. the Islam's persecution of Christianity, or at least an interpretation of Islam in many Muslim countries, goes back now a, a good generation. It's never been a good relationship. Um, at its best, Islamic countries have tolerated Christians, even protected them with a head tax that could be 50% of their income, um, but they have lived. Egypt was a majority Christian country. It, it, it wasn't that Islam always existed. People have very short memories or no knowledge of history. Islam came in from elsewhere, from Arabia, but the status quo developed, I understand that. But Christians never enjoyed equality, but they did certainly have a certain form of tolerance and, and understanding. You've seen uh, a different interpretation of Islam, in particular in the past uh, 30 years. And now, those countries that do use Sharia law and Quranic principles as the foundation of their culture do not treat Christians very well at all. Take Pakistan, for example. Uh, Jinnah was a very sophisticated man. Uh, he would probably be killed today, by the way, by, by the Taliban. Or, Should explain who he is. Well, Jinnah was a founder of modern Pakistan, a man uh, very pro-British. He took the Muslim League into alliance with the British during the Second World War. He wanted Pakistan to be less an Islamic state than a state for Muslims to live. Uh, in, in Pakistan, Christians were respected. Actually, so were Jews. Uh, for the past 25 years, maybe a little longer, a blasphemy law has meant that there is terrible persecution, not just of Christians, but Christians are persecuted and arrested, sometimes killed by the mob if they're arrested on blasphemy law. Christians are, are, are murdered. Uh, just the other day, a Christian couple were beaten to death for allegedly defacing a Quran. I generally agree with Michael. By and large, I agree with Michael's argument. Um, I was in Pakistan recently, and uh, while I was there, the, the High Court uh, in Lahore, Pakistan, rejected the appeal of Asia Bibi, who is the Christian woman, and she's been on death row in, in, in Pakistan. She's languished in a, a Pakistani prison for the last five years. And why is she there? She, well, she's accused of blasphemy. She's, a, she's, she's a, accused of uh, having insulted the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, there was an altercation between her and, and two, uh, two Muslim women who refused to share uh, the same utensil with her. This eating, was the, the drinking exactly, of... Exactly. And, and she, she said something in that altercation. We don't know what she said. There were no witnesses. There were no independent witnesses there. Uh, but, but, you know, she, she was apprehended. She has been in a Pakistani prison. And, and, and I think that the idea of blasphemy or blaspheming is very much germane to Orthodox Islam. So I think that that, that is an example of uh, how you can uh, attribute, you know, the, the discrimination. I think there is discrimination systemic. Uh, in Muslim countries, and I think that we have to be honest about it. Are, let me ask this side of the table, are you not being, in the words of Farzana, honest about what is at the root of a lot well, of this there's persecution the difference in the world? between systemic discrimination and Islam waging a war against Christianity and Christians. Right, this is another thing is that by using hyperbolic language, right, I think it distracts from the real issues, which Farzana mentioned, and how we could actually achieve solutions for these real problems. There is, of course, massive amounts of structural discrimination um, and uh, sometimes violence um, and sometimes marginalization. But it's not simply directed to Christians because they're Christians. That's one way it manifests itself. It's, not, it's one way it manifests itself, right? But you have massive structural injustices and bad government and um, weak institutions. So if he'd said this is more politically based or culturally based rather than religiously Absolutely. based, you'd be okay with Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Wouldn't be true. Though. Absolutely. It wouldn't be true. Of, of, as I, I say in the book, I'm, I'm not sure if you to, have read the book. I, I, I didn't get a chance to finish. Okay, I didn't sorry. interrupt you, right? Well, you did. Go, go ahead, Mohammed. Go ahead. Uh, you know, if we're going to get into a religious dis d debate, right, then we actually, you know, what the imam said, you have to use your sources properly and, um, and uh, you have to use the right sources. Again, I don't like to get into the theological debates because as a lawyer, I'm sort of agnostic 
as to the relevance of theology and the way people behave, because most people are theologically ignorant. Well, okay? let me, but, but um, many of the verses he cites in the Quran don't have anything to do with Christianity, right? He, he omits lots of he omits, he omits several verses in the Quran that deal specifically about the import of the sanctity of houses of worship of any religion. He don't he omits an explicit verse that talks about love between Muslims and Christians. And so it's a very that's a very See, selective I, I, I reading. Respond to this now, because this, we, is, this is not but true. This is, it's, this is I don't think it's, not true. I don't think it's relevant. See, well, I don't think it's relevant that you said something which isn't true. When I, I quote various passages, there is much I could I don't even, and I, I don't quote the hadith at all, I think you, you may notice, because I think in many ways that's more severe. Well, but let's remember, it's, it's, this is less than a 200 page book. No, I didn't I, want to cover I, I, I've, I've, I've nothing to be ashamed of okay. here. When I quote verses in the Quran, I do not say they're specific to Christians because they are not. Uh, and I also speak about where, and I mention lyrical, poetic phrases within the Quran. I talk about this, I speak about this. I speak about the first victims, if anything, of radical Islam being other Muslims. I'm, I'm at pains to stress this. But th this is very interesting. There is a mass persecution taking place. And I, I don't know you, so I do know Shibir, and I'm sure you're appalled by it. What is happening in many countries where there's a Muslim majority or even a significant Muslim minority, that needs to be discussed. Even though if you want to argue Islam doesn't preach this, I'll listen to you. But you must surely admit that it's being done by Muslims in the name of Islam, not economic injustice, not oppression, but in the name of Islam. That let's, has to be addressed. Let's find out. Imam, I, I, do, you, do you agree that these killings, and he has chronicled them chapter and verse in the book, have been done by people who are Islamic, who are Muslims, in the name of their faith? I don't mean to deny the discrimination and the killings that do exist, and uh, I would like to put them in the same context in which uh, Professor Fadl has uh, nicely put them. Uh, but at the same time, I maintain that uh, uh, Michael is not using proper sources to document these events, and uh, that's apart from the fact that he has the wrong interpretation of these uh, events. But you're not uh, denying the events took place, are you? Well, well, that too, is, some of it is questionable, Good highly God. questionable. For example, one of Michael's sources that he praises very highly is an article from Shobat.com, which is run by uh, uh, Walid Shobat and his son. Well, his son what usually recently, uh, the, 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 the article which uh, Michael cites was written by both authors, but one author wrote this just recently, and this is how he concludes his article. These Albanians and the rest of the pagan Muslims of the Balkans need annihilation by a righteous Christian nation. God bless the Serbs for killing these reprobates, and may God appalling. curse Clinton for bombing these righteous Christian people. Appalling. Now, now, appalling, yes. And what do I say but about in your the book? book you what do said, I say about it? You have actually said that they are a very good source, that yes. they, they and I also check out their information I, very sir, carefully. I also criticize them for what they have written. The, the you did not. The, I say that the information, sir, this is important because people tell are dying. Where, tell the me where you the have information, them. the information is accurate. If you criticize, if you can criticize any of the information about the slaughter and killing, I will listen to you. I've never been a supporter or fan of the, uh, particularly of one of the people involved here, but to criticize the sources Tell of the Tell me issue. where you have said that they are wrong. <laughs> Tell me in your book. I'm not going to And I will this show you right where you have actually I, this, praised this them. Is, you uh, said what each denial, by this is denial, denial of massacre. This is, this I am not denying objection. the massacre, but your like, book is proving to be a distraction <laughs> from the actual killing and discrimination that is actually when there and that we need to deal with. One of the things I am trying to get a better handle on is there is, and again, I don't know, Sheldon, I'm throwing you a bit of a curveball here, whether we can go back to that chart we had up at the very beginning here. I'm noticing that the price per barrel, if you compare, for example, Brent crude oil and West Texas Intermediate, they're both around $85 a barrel. Look at the top right there of the screen, 85 and 85 And then I see Western Canada select down at 67 Anybody got any theories, Elena, about why that differential is in place? So there's always been a differential. Western Canadian crude trades at a lower price um, compared with West Texas because it's heavier, it requires more refining, it has always traded at a discount. What's actually really interesting about that chart is that the gap between the Canadian crude and the West Texas price has decreased over time. So we're seeing a $30 drop in the price of both West Texas and Brent since June. Actually, it's more than 30 as of today. But the Canadian price has only gone down by 20 relative to, um, to West Texas. Hmm. So in other words, that's the discount at which Canadian crude from the oil sands, for example, or any Canadian crude trades to U.S. crude, and we're being punished relatively less, in a sense, by the decline. Um, okay. uh, well, part of that, I mean, there's the fact that heavy is always more protected. There is also, there's been greater supply. Um, 
that's been able to reach the U.S. refineries. That has to do with the transportation issue and the rail, the growth of rail. So more Canadian crude, there's less of a glut than there has been historically at some U.S. choke points. And more Canadian crude is able to actually get to market, which decreases that differential. Um, the Canadian dollar is also protecting uh, Canadian producers at the same time. So even though it looks like the Canadian price is even lower, if you were to translate into U.S. dollars, yes. Canadian producers' input costs are in Canadian dollars, and therefore they're selling at U.S. dollars, and that also helps them. Interesting. Okay, got it. Armin, it always feels, uh, could be wrong about this, but it feels like oil is one of the most unpredictable things in this world, commodities to price. You just almost never know when it's going to go up, when it's going to go down. Jeffrey was telling us earlier there aren't too many people who saw this coming. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being, of course we knew this was going to happen, 10 being, my goodness gracious, the sky is falling, can't imagine this happening. Where do you see oil right now on that continuum? The price uh, changes. Oh, I, I don't know going forward, but can I, can I just say, I remember going to the Bank of Canada meeting not long ago, about two or three years ago, where their forecasts were de dependent on a scenario fan of between, I think it was as low as $60 a barrel and 180 <laughs> And they were trying to figure out, well, where are we heading? So you can bet your booties that the smart people know that it could go anywhere. It could go uh, sideways, it could go up, it could go down right now. The chances, as uh, we, we, we heard, we're on, are now on the downside of the volatility mm -hmm. equation for all the reasons that we're, we're talking about. But what's fascinating is that governments have priced in their budgets at a certain dollar, uh, do dollar a bar barrel value. And at the federal level, I think we're going to get hit harder than at the Alberta level. We've been announcing billions of dollars, annual dollars, in tax cuts before the surplus has even arrived. We had a $2.9 billion, $3 billion cushion. That was blown out of the water last month when the prices had fallen by 25% for crude oil. They've now fallen by 33% as of today, as, as, we, as we mentioned. Liquefied natural gas has fallen by 17%. Uh, sorry, natural gas has fallen by 17%. Those two, oil and gas, account for 6% of GDP, and their share of the economy has been growing. So, you know, step one, more volatile prices. Step two, less investment because of dropping prices. Step three, slower growth. This is starting to get baked in, and we're going to have a very unpleasant um, uh, surprise, I think, on the other side of the election at the federal level where we discover we didn't have as much money as we thought. The cupboard is more empty than so we Jeffrey, thought. So, Jeffrey, the, uh, the income-splitting announcement, for example, that the prime minister made the other day, he shouldn't be so quick to spend that dividend because if it keeps going this way, that money's not going to be there. Is that fair to say? Well, it depends on what kind of uh, numbers are baked into the budget. I mean, if you take a look at Alberta, for instance, um, yes, they're getting hit on the oil side to some degree. But uh, if you look at the um, overall budget when it comes to the dollar, when it comes to the various types of crude, when it comes to natural gas, they're only, you know, a few percentage points below where they figured they would be. Uh, right now. Actually, they were way above back in the summertime. I mean, natural gas prices were higher than expected. Oil prices were higher than expected. So, I mean, it really kind of depends on when they decide to kind of restack the deck and decide, okay, well, this is, uh, this is an affordable program and this isn't an affordable program. But it does show how important the oil has become to this national and provincial economy. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's hot more than it has been in the past and it's, it only seems to be growing in terms of importance. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here because I want to come back to Canada later. Let me refocus now on uh, the international situation. Uh, Elena, even though global demand for oil has fallen over the last few months, I note OPEC is not curbing its production which it has done in the past in order to try to get the prices back up. Why isn't it doing it this time? Well, I think that goes back to some of what we were talking about earlier on, and that's a fight for market share. And again, you could really look all the way back to the fracking revolution and the, the wells that were drilled in Texas a decade ago uh, when people figured out how to get uh, oil out of rocks that you previously could not, could not access. Um, and that has created all of this new supply. There was one CEO last week, um, the, the CEO of Exxon referred to uh, a new era of energy abundance. So you, you could think about what Saudi's doing really as a response to and an effort to cope with a new era of energy, of energy abundance. But that's if you believe that supply and demand are the critical rational factors in Saudi Arabia's behavior. Well, that's a long way from the days of the sky is falling, peak oil mm -hmm. is upon us, 
you know, let's go hide in our caves, right? I mean, those, no one said, I don't hear that, that much being said about that anymore. Well, we see another example of all this in oil and politics don't mix with the, the Canadian-U.S. situation. Uh, you know, about the time that Keystone was first discussed, they were, at CERN, they were trying to discover about the beginning of the universe, okay? Mm -hmm. While CERN solved that problem, we're still not solved Keystone. <laughs> uh, and so, now why is that? Well, um, this is a classic example where pure politics in the U.S., which is impure politics, got in the way. But then there was a response. The oil sands company started getting trains. They got the train cars, and all of a sudden, just as much was coming out and going into the U.S., and it was taking up space that the farmers needed when they've had two bumper crops in a row. So the impact on this, on American and Canadian farmers, has been extremely painful because the actual, you don't take the prices that grains are trading at on the Board of Trade, the actual basis the farmer gets now is about 60% of that price because they can't get it anywhere because it's taken up by the same trains which are traveling through cities, occasionally setting them on fire, and that's all happening because <laughs> Obama wouldn't let Keystone go through. Perfect example of when you let oil and politics mix together, it becomes a disaster. Don, I, I have a booker from The Letterman Show on the other line who wants, <laughs> wants, wants you on the show right after we're done here tonight. Hey, okay, Carol. Jeffrey, you come on in. Yeah, so I just might wonder, it, it may not be quite as entertaining, but I will <laughs> mention that um, as far as OPEC goes, uh, it'd be re we'd probably be remiss if we didn't mention that there is a major OPEC meeting coming up at the end of this month. So while this game of chicken is going on with regard to market share and prices, uh, there are, a, I mean, all eyes in the oil world are on uh, that meeting and whether OPEC can come together as a group uh, and agree on some kind of production ceiling to prevent uh, this, uh, this uh, crude price from falling off the cliff. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety. They're all on our website, theagenda.tvo.org, on our iTunes channel and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.